Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we answer your bike and tech-related questions that you've been submitting using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and then we try and offer the best advice we can. Let's dive straight into our first question for this week. And it's from It's Mark. Great username. It says, hi, Alex and slash or Dr. Ollie. Is it okay to use a carbon endurance bike? So that's a giant Defy with 32, um, 32 centimeter or millimeter wide tires, sorry, on a gravel trail. And if so, how is it best to protect the frame? And they also say they don't want to use those permanent stick on protectors. Yeah, it sure is okay to use your road bike on some gravel trails, but I wouldn't do anything too extreme. So your sort of canal paths, smooth gravel tracks, they'll be more than fine on your road bike. But yeah, as I say, anything too extreme and you might want to use a dedicated gravel bike. And in terms of protecting the frame, if you don't want to use those permanent stick-on protectors, you're going to struggle a little bit, although you could try to find some suitable mud guards to go on your bike because that would help stop some of those stones and bits of gravel flying up and chipping the paintwork, which is kind of inevitable if you're going to ride on gravelly surfaces. Personally, I'd say your best bet is to use some of those stick-on protectors and just get ones that are removable so they haven't got a super strong glue on them. So, hope hey, that helps. Next up, we've got a question from Eddie Spilby, who says, I've got a 10-year-old Shimano 105 equipped specialized tarmac. Would it make a noticeable enough difference to upgrade to the current 105 or Ultegra? So is it worth upgrading, basically? Or would it be better off buying a completely new bike that has those components on? God, that's a good question. Uh, 105, especially the current stuff, is a whole world apart from 105 10 years ago. In fact, so much so that a little while ago, Ollie and Cy did an experiment to see if they could tell the difference between Dura Ace and 105 when they're blindfolded. And it turns out they really struggled to tell the difference. So there you have it. Dura Ace and 105 on a blindfold test is quite comparable. But in terms of your bike, you can take whichever option suits you best. Yes, upgrading your current bike to current 105 is a good option, but if you if you want to upgrade to a new bike, you are going to get the latest and greatest tech, and it will be a little bit better than that 10-year-old bike. But if you like your bike, just upgrade the group set and be happy with what you've got. So no need to do either way, just pick out whatever's best for you. Next question in is from David. He says, hello GCM. I have carbon bars with an alloy stem, and whenever I'm in the drops or sprinting, it keeps making a clicking noise at the clamp area. If I use, it says he uses a fiber paste and I've tightened the bolts up to almost their maximum torque setting, but nothing helps. Please tell me you have something for this because it drives me mad. Um, well, first up, hello David, thanks for your question. The first thing I would try to do is lubricate the thread on the bolts to make sure as you're tightening them up, the force that you're tightening them up is applying onto the clamp directly because if they're a bit dry, it's not going to help them tighten up. And also, you say that you've almost tightened them to the maximum torque. So I would definitely do them up to the recommended torque setting all the way up. So if it says six newton meters, do them up to six newton meters. And if you're still struggling with your problem, I would look at considering some of the other components that are around the area. So you could look at where the stem clamps onto the steer, for example, or some of the spaces if you've got those underneath the stem. And further still, you could just take the whole fork and headset apart, give it a clean and service, grease everything up, and hopefully that might help sort you out. Because it's not always the first area that you've looked at that's causing your noise. Next question is from Bro Collie or broccoli, I presume, I'm um, supposed to say. They say, is carbon fiber just a posh way of saying plastic? Um, no, no, it's not. So plastic uses polymers as its main component part and is completely different to carbon fiber. So as the name suggests, carbon fiber is made up of fibers of carbon that are then weaved together to form a material which is then formed into the shapes of our bikes. And then this carbon fiber is infused with resin and it's that resin that cures and causes the carbon fiber to be cured and remain in the shape that it was formed into. And I guess the resin can kind of be considered similar to a plastic because it uses polymers as some of the component parts of it. But in terms of our bikes, I don't think there's any way you can call it plastic. Maybe if you had a bike purely made from resin with no carbon fiber, but um, 
it's just a bit of a bit of a silly joke question, but carbon fiber is very different to plastic. So as long as we've cleared that up. Next question is from Dominic Wright, who says, in order to avoid Shermer's neck um, when riding in a time trial position, are there any glasses or visors that use prisms or mirrors that could allow you to keep your head down whilst you're riding and not have to look up? Well, this is not something I've considered before or even knew what Sherman's neck was. So I actually had to do a little bit of research online to find out. Sherman's neck is a, is a problem referred to when the muscles in your neck and your back are fatigued and so tired that you struggle to actually lift the weight of your head to look up when you're riding along on the bike. And in terms of any glasses or visors, again, it's not something I've ever considered before. So I did have to do an in-depth bit of research online to see what I could find. And I did find something called the pediscope. And this was a sort of mirrored system, like we were saying, so you can keep your head down and still see where you're going. Although it was an unsuccessful campaign on Kickstarter. So presumably not enough people thought it was a good idea. Something also I came across while researching this was something called a bike periscope. I know this isn't what you're after, but who knew something like that existed? This is designed for cargo bikes and riders that have so much stuff stacked up on the front of their bike that they actually can't see where they're going. So this allows them to go up and over the top of their boxes. Who knew this kind of stuff existed, eh? Next up is our question from Phil Lentz, who says, on his drive back from a weekend vacation with a road bike on the roof, caught in a huge rainstorm oh no so his bike was soaking wet on the back of a car in a rainstorm what maintenance should i do before putting my bike back on the roads besides the obvious um, i wouldn't wouldn't stress don't stress don't worry just give your bike a normal wash normal clean and dry it all down just how you would do if you'd been out for a wet mucky ride on the road there's no need to do any special servicing or maintenance whatsoever the only time you would ever need to take the components off your bike, maybe drain them out from water, or is if your bike has been completely submerged. But let's face it, that's not really going to happen unless you crash into a river or a lake, and presumably you haven't done that. So uh, yeah, give your bike normal wash, dry it all off, and then lubricate it. Nice and simple. Next question is from Philip Str or Philipster. Yeah, go with that. It says I recently purchased my first road bike and the manufacturer says I need to get the first inspection done after 300 kilometers. Is it really that important or can I neglect that advice? Yes, it is important and it is always a good idea if you've got a brand new bike to get it checked after the first few rides, first 300 kilometers as this example gives. And the reason for that is kind of a bit of a safety check. You're trying to make sure no components have come loose, make sure the gears are still working correctly. And it's really just to give you that little bit of peace of mind that everything is safe, everything's secure, and your bike works as best as it can. In fact, I actually made a video a little while ago of the kind of checks that you could make to your bike beforehand when you head out riding to make sure it's nice and safe. So you could head over and check that out, but it's fairly simple stuff that you're checking over. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have bought your bike from an actual bike shop, then chances are most of them offer that service for free. So just head in and they'll be able to give your bike a quick one saver and make sure it's all okay. Next question in is from Mohammed Tufek, who says, how often should I charge Shimano Ultegra DI2 group set? 60 kilometers, 80 kilometers, or once a month? So you've said you're using Ultegra DI2, although Dura-Ace and Ultegra use exactly the same batteries and exactly the same little motors inside the derailleurs. So it's gonna apply whether it's Dura-Ace or Ultegra. And the best advice I can give is just to set a reminder in your phone or your calendar to charge it up once a month. It is of course gonna vary loads, depends on how you ride, how long you ride, and crucially, what temperatures you ride in, because cold temperatures will make the battery last significantly less than what it otherwise would have done. And you can always just check the level of the battery by pressing and holding one of the buttons on the shifters, and then that'll cause the junction box lights to illuminate. And if they light up green, you've got plenty of battery. If it flashes green when you do that, that's when you know you're starting to run down to sort of 50% or so on your battery charge. If it lights up red, definitely you need to charge it up because it's gonna run out soon. And then if it flashes red, at that moment, you're about to lose the operation of the front derailleur, and then you're left with probably, I think about 50 clicks or changes on the rear derailleur. So that's when you really need to be careful on changing gear and get home ASAP. 
Right, on to our last question for this week's Tech Clinic, and it's from Akash Gohail, who says, I started cycling, bought a road bike, um, it was actually his first road bike, and he's bought an aero bike with Shimano Sora, and also he's got disc brakes. But the downside of this is, it's 10 kilograms. So is it a good bike, or should I look for a new one? Uh, it sounds like a great place to start out. I don't think you need to invest loads of money into your first road bike. It sounds like you've got a bike focused on a bit of aerodynamics. You've got disc brakes, which represents the latest technology. Some people love them, some people don't. But I wouldn't worry that it's a bit heavier than some of the other bikes. It really doesn't matter. And it sounds like it's a great starting point for your first bike. So you can get into cycling, ride it loads, decide if you love it. And if you do find you really like cycling and you're interested in bikes or the equipment and the technology behind it, then you could start to consider upgrading to a newer bike. But I wouldn't obsess over it because you don't need it. Although, like everyone says, it is very nice to have a fancy bike, but it's not always required. That's it for this week's GCN Tech Minute. I hope you found it helpful. And if I haven't got to your question, sorry, but keep submitting it using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And we'll try and get to it next week. The best place to put those questions is in the most recent tech clinic, and then I'll try and pick them up. Right, see you later.